Hello, everybody. My name is Harry Biddle. I'm a data engineer at Trace at the Stockholm Environment Institute. Um, and I'm presenting Trace today, uh, which is a, um, stands for uh, Transparency for Sustainable Economies. Um, and it's about uh, de tropical deforestation and the relationship with, with global trade. Um, I feel like a silly news again. Uh, so I'm going to uh, give you an introduction to Trace the Project, then we're going to do a little bit of a workshop, uh, and at the end we'll have a discussion. Uh, this is what I'm talking about, <laughs> commodity driven de deforestation. This is a picture of um, Kalimantan in, in Borneo, Indonesia. Um, and on the left you see Bornean rainforest, and on the right land has been cleared in preparation for a palm oil plantation. Um, yeah, over 95% of deforestation is driven in some way by the plantation of commodities. So that can be that can be directly planting a commodity. It can also be, you know, a land a land grab. Or oh, actually, something I, I was going to mention is that there's a lot of there's a hypothesis at the moment. Well, we're pretty sure that uh, currently in Brazil there's been a, a very sharp uptick in in, de, in de, deforestation because people are trying to grab land. Uh, while, Bol while Bolsonaro is still in power. Because the expectation is that if, if, if Lula is elected, then uh, regulations around deforestation in Brazil will be tight tightened up. So people are basically just buying land while they still can and then clearing it um, so that they've kind of got that status and then they can kind of sell it, sell it later. Well, they might sell it, they might not sell it. Um, so land, land spec speculation is also a huge part of commodity-driven deforestation. Um, and it is very much concentrated in, to, to, uh, today at least, uh, or at the moment, in the tropical regions. Um, so this is data from the University of Maryland based on NASA satellite images. Uh, and it's showing in each 10 kilometer square what is the main driver of tree cover loss uh, in, in, in that square. Um, so that's simply that the trees were there and the trees weren't there. It's not necessarily the same as deforestation because the trees could be planted again, uh, as in the case of uh, forestry in the north. Um, but what I'm interested in today is the red cells, which are uh, commodity-driven deforestation. So what we're saying here is that in that 10 kilometer square, the main driver of def deforestation in the square is commodities. It's not that the whole square has been de uh, de deforested, it's just the drivers. And you see here in Latin America, uh, it's very much uh, well. It's very much soy and beef, and those those two sectors are quite in, interlinked because people will clear forest, put cows on it, and then a few years later put soy on it, and then use the soy to feed the cows. So the soy and beef sectors are very much intertwined. And then here in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, the main drivers are palm oil, um, wood pulp, and paper. <laughs> If you're, by the way, if you're interested in um, reading more about uh, about how difficult it is to, to to be transparent about what's causing deforestation and what the drivers are, there's a really wonderful paper uh, published a couple of weeks ago by my colleagues in Science. Uh, it is called I've forgotten what it's called, um, but I have a I have a link to it at the end, um, and it shows just how complex the drivers are of of, of, de of deforestation. <clears throat> uh, so deforestation in tropical regions, in particular, is a big driver of global warming. I've seen estimates from seven to thirty percent of global CO2 emissions, depending on how you count it. Um, but uh, a direct carbon comparison isn't so useful because there are also a host of other uh, advantages that forests give the climate. Uh, local cooling effects, how it affects the weather, the value of biodiversity, uh, and so on. Um, now, if you look at soy in Brazil, most of the soy that's produced in Brazil is exported um, to other countries. And there are very, very strong economic pressures from the global economy um, that make clearing forests much, much cheaper than conserving forests, which is a bit of a crazy, uh, crazy scenario. Um, <coughs> but so, Soy for Brazil is exported a lot to China, a lot to, to, to Europe, and this creates very strong economic incentives in those countries to, uh, to, to de deforest. So if we're to understand tropical deforestation, it's very, very important to look at global trade. And of course, we have millions of ships, um, container ships. Uh, there's a great site, which is, I think, Global Shipping Watch. You can see live all the container ships, and it's just crazy. There's just trade bouncing around all over the world. 
Um, and if we're going to make progress on this issue, we need good data about what's happening. And there's been a few uh, ideas proposed. How can we bring data to the system in order to understand it and understand how to change it? Uh, one um, proposal is called farm to fork. So that's where you, you trace a product right back from where it was grown to the person who's buying it. So you can imagine you go into a coffee shop and you buy a bag of coffee and it says this coffee was grown by Mr. Whoever just outside of wherever. Um, there's also been proposals to bring blockchain um, to, the, uh, to, the, to the problem here. Uh, you can kind of imagine blockchain, you can record a transaction for every time that coffee changed, changed, changed hands and then you have a kind of immutable record and you can trace things, things, things back. The problem with most of these proposals is either that they, are, they cover too small a sector of, uh, or too small a slice of the global trade, um, and a lot of the trade we're interested in is trade that would happen outside of those, um, <laughs> uh, outside of the like conscious consumer path, um, or that they just come too too late. And we need uh, we need data on this now um, because it's a very pressing problem. Uh, we can't also say necessarily, yeah, the, the, obviously the spatial component within, say, Brazil is very important. Uh, a cow that was reared on land that was in the frontiers of deforestation is very, very different to one that's been reared on land from, from decades ago. So it's very, very important to get uh, a spatial picture within the country. So Trace's proposal um, is that we already have um, plenty enough data to be able to map the, the middle part of the supply chain to a, to a good enough accuracy that we can take action on it. So I'll, I'll explain what that means. So this is a simplified uh, model of the supply chain for beef. Uh, so we have a cow that's reared on a farm, and that farm is located in a municipality in Brazil. Um, when, the, when the cow is big enough, it's sent to a slaughterhouse, uh, the meat is then exported out of Brazil. Um, there's a change of ownership uh, from the exporter to the importer. It's imported into a country, it goes into a supermarket, and it ends up being eaten by, by, by someone who buys it in a shop. So that's one example of a kind of simple um, supply chain. Now, we have good data on parts of this. So between the two ports, port of export and port of import, um, there's uh, UN trade data, which tells us exactly how much volume is going from which country. Uh, we also often have um, customs records within the country um, for, for, for ta taxation reasons. So we know who owns each container, how much it's worth, um, which port it came, 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 came from, who's responsible for taxing it, and that kind of stuff. So we have pretty good data on, on the trade part. Um, we also have records of slaughterhouses in Brazil. Um, so again, um, we, the Brazilian government puts out um, who owns each slaughterhouse, where the slaughterhouses are, lo are located. We also have estimates per municipality of how many total cows are slaughtered. We have estimates of production of how many cows. So we have kind of bits of data on part of this. And it's enough to be able to map this middle part. So we don't have really good enough data to go right down to a farm level, but we can get down to a municipality level. Uh, we also don't have data really beyond the port of import because this is typically a private, um, this is typically a private supply chain, and private companies are very, um, you know, they want to hold their data for like a, a competitive advantage. So this data is hard to come by, but this middle part we can do a good job. And our argument is that this is enough to be able to take action on the problem. Now, since we have the municipality. Uh, and for reference, municipality in Brazil, for example, is about 15,000 square kilometers. So that's about 120 by 120 kilometers box. Once we know the municipality, we can combine that with satellite data, and we can say, OK, what's the deforestation uh, in that municipality? And then we can, we, can attribute it, we can attribute the deforestation to all of the goods which are exported. And because we're doing this for, the, for, for all of the volume of the supply chain, we can say, OK, we, we know that from this municipality, 10% of it went to, to, to Russia and 10% of it to Germany and that kind of stuff. So we can take that deforestation and we can apportion out the risk among all of the exports from the municipality. So another way of thinking about this is if you have a container ship of, of, of beef meat arriving in a port, we can, we can label that container with, 
where were the, which municipality were the cows raised, how much deforestation was in that municipality. We can also take things like what was the water scarcity, other environmental indicators, is there evidence of forced labor. So we can kind of attach a bunch of uh, metadata to the container that, 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 that arrives. So what kind of things can we do with this data? Uh, so this is just one example. Uh, we have many, many more on our site. Um, so this is imports of Brazilian soy, and it's just filtered down to those imports that went to China, and this is data from 2018. Um, and what you're seeing here is a heat map of deforestation risk. Um, so you have, it's measured in, in hect hectares of deforestation that we've apportioned to China for 2018. Um, and uh, I'm not showing you the, the volume here, but this, this red region uh, up top there is called uh, Matupiba. And that region is responsible for only 9% of the volume, of the total volume of soy, but it's responsible for 80% of the deforestation risk. Whereas if you take a region like here, this, this south region, that's responsible for 35% of the volume and less than 1% of the, of, the, of the deforestation risk. So this is very typical. Uh, we find in our data is this kind of power, this, this power law, where actually it's a relatively small part of the supply chain that's responsible for a lot of the deforestation risk. And that tells us, okay, we can just concentrate our efforts in one, in one place. And if you look at Matupiba, for, for those... Uh, for the deforestation risk associated with that region, 75% of the risk is associated with just five exporting, com exporting companies. So immediately the problem has been uh, reduced there. Yes, question. Yes. <laughs> you say it was 80% or 18%? 80%, 80%. 80%. Yeah. 9% of the soy, 80% of the deforestation. Exactly, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 quite, it's, quite, it's, it's quite striking. And we've, we've re reproduced this in um, many other supply chains around the world. So this is, this is Brazilian soy. We have modeled, um, I think it's 11, 11 different commodities in about seven different countries. Uh, so we're, we're covering about 60% of the uh, trade in forest risk commodities at the moment. The other 40% is kind of a, well, diminishing, re, um, diminishing returns for our work, but we're covering the vast majority of, of trade. Um, and we see this kind of distrib dis dis distribution happening in lots of other countries and lots of other commodities um, as well. So there's another example of what we've done with this data. Um, I'm just going to give you two here. Um, this is a report that was written in May, um, and it was done in collaboration with, uh, with GIZ, the German Development Agency. Um, and the report is assessing the tropical deforestation in Germany's uh, agricultural commodity supply chains. Um, it's part of the um, pre preparation for a bunch of laws which are being proposed at the moment in the EU, in the UK, and the US for deforestation-free um, supply chains. So the law would, would place, as far as I understand it, it would place requirements on uh, companies based in Germany or based in the EU to kind of audit their supply chains and check that their supply chains are, de are deforestation free. So we're, we're part, of the, um, part of the advisory group for, 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 the, for those laws. And um, as part of that, we produced this, um, this report, but actually showed that Germany's deforestation risk is one of the highest in all of the, um, the five major signatories to this, to this law. And also it's one of the uh, most intense in the, ten in the sense of deforestation risk per kilogram consumed. Um, so you can read that report. I'll put a link up at the end. Um, another example is here on the right. This is some work we did with the French government recently. Um, it's an interactive dashboard and it's targeted at uh, public and private actors. Um, the idea is that you can, you can go on, and this is the deforestation risk um, associated with soy imports to France. You can see these kind of numbers again here. I think this is 20% of the volume is responsible for 80% of the risk. I'm not quite sure. Um, <coughs> but you can go onto there, and then you can filter down. So if, if you're a company and you happen to know who is importing, who your importer and your supply chain is, you can filter down to that importer and look at your own, uh, your own risk. 
So this is just two, two examples. I included this one because it's an example of a, of a dashboard we've built um, off of our data, whereas this is just an example of an analysis we did. Um, but what I'm more interested in today is uh, trace kind of as a, as a uh, data transparency or an open data initiative, and this is where you come in, because uh, I'm hoping that there um, will either be someone in the audience who wants to use trace data or has an idea how to use trace data, or who has experience with open data transparency initiatives. I should say that all of our data is free, so you can just go online and, and, and um, access it. Um, yeah, so I'm hoping to kind of learn a bit from, uh, from, from you, and this is where the workshop comes in. So, uh, I am a data engineer, um, and the kind of challenges I think that we have in Trace at the moment, uh, in particular for our kind of open data portion of it, are these. Um, so, firstly, how do we best give users access to our data? Um, we, we target an awful lot of people. We're really trying to get our data out there and in use. Um, we're targeting civil society, journalists, directors on the board of soy trading com companies, uh, um, hackers, techies, researchers. So we have quite a wide range of, um, of users, and we're trying to give people the access that, that makes most sense to them. So on the one hand, we have a website where you can just kind of point and click and just see our data. But on the other hand, we also have an API where you can access it and do things with it. So hopefully there's kind of something for, for every kind of level of, of user. And then how do we shorten the journey between data appreciation and actual use? Um, so we have tried to make our website look appealing and, and show how useful our data is, but we kind of need to make the jump from people saying, oh, that, that's kind of cool, to people actually then actually using it and doing things with it. Uh, and finally, how should we engage with the open source community? So all of our data is public and open, um, but at the moment our methods aren't, um, and I, I do wonder whether we should uh, open source our tools and our methods and whether that's useful and how I best go about doing that. So I haven't really um, shown you the data itself yet, and that's kind of on purpose, because I was hoping we could discuss those points, but I thought they might make a little bit more sense if you've, if you've seen our site and seen our data. So my proposal is, and this is what I'm calling the little like, workshop part, my proposal is um, that we spend about 10 minutes just using, the, uh, using these two tools, one of these two, two tools, um, to answer a question, and you can do this on a laptop or you can just do it on your phone. Um, and then uh, afterwards, hopefully there'll be some more questions or some feedback and we can have a little, um, little, little discussion or I can expand on any of the points. If that sounds good. So the two tools I have are the, the Data Explorer and the Data API. Um, the Explorer is this website that we've built recently um, where you can just kind of click, click around and you get some prepackaged graphs. Uh, the data API is where you can actually um, submit an SQL query. Um, so if you're, if you're more th kind of a programmer or looking to use the SQL, that might be good. Otherwise, if you're just on your phone, uh, you might want to use the first, the first tool. And uh, I have two kind of tasks uh, which you could do if you wanted to. The first is, can you find out which three commodities are most responsible for Germany's imported deforestation risk? And the second is, uh, which biome in Brazil has the biggest soy-driven deforestation risk? So hopefully that'll make a bit more sense when you go on the site, and I'll give you 10 minutes. Feel free to, to pair up with your neighbor, if you like. <laughs> and we'll come back in 10 minutes. Let me know if you have any problems accessing the, accessing the site as well. Oh, I don't know if, if anybody's using the data API. 
uh, if you go on that site, um, you'll see a bunch of tables. And uh, what you need to do is click on a table, and then there'll be a tab, which is query. Um, and, that, and there you can type in your SQL query. I'm not hearing anybody making any complaints, so I hope, I hope everything's working. <laughs> No, no, no. Uh, they're no, uh, cross-related. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Choose, choose whichever one you want. Whichever, choose whichever question you want, and then whichever tool you want. I, I would probably use Explore. Pardon? In both, in both tools. Yeah. <laughs> and they're just examples of things you could do. Also, feel free just to explore the site if you want. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, so we have the importing countries, uh, which is at the bottom, and then the top section is the more about the ex the exporting or the producing countries. Someone say something? Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I think I've actually forgotten the answer to the first one. Yeah, biome, uh, like a. Uh, you can you can divide up a country into political boundaries, or you can divide it into kind of ecosystem boundaries. So a biome would be the boundaries of a particular ecosystem, like a, a uh, the boundary of a particular ecosystem. So for example, a biome might be a, like wetlands area, 
or a, a forest, like the Amazon forest would be a biome, and the mangrove, the mangrove forest in Ecuador would be a biome. Yeah. I think on the, one of the pages, uh, the pages for Brazil, we, we, we break down uh, the, the deforestation risk by, by various kind of regions. One of those regions is political regions. And if you scroll down, then one of them is, is biomes. Uh, just for Germany. Yeah, so then so there's an interesting question of is, okay, what's the biggest deforestation risk for the whole world? That's not something you can answer on our site at the moment because you can only filter, I think, you can only filter import to Germany or, okay, I'm just going to look at Brazilian soy. So I can't then say what's Brazilian soy globally compared to Paraguay and Grief globally. That's not possible on our site. You could answer it through the API, but I think not through the Explorer. Yeah. yeah. A UI issue? Yeah, yeah, please. I just wanted to write it down. <laughs> yeah, I tried to get off around this uh, thing. I, so I, I selected the yeah. regional production. If I go in, then we lose. Ah, OK. And I can't select any of them first. Oh. Is it the same page? Is it just? Yeah, I don't. Is, the, is, it, is it Safari as well? Sorry? Is it also Safari? No, no, no. I, I was wondering what, what yeah, browser it was. Put Opera and Chrome. Opera and Chrome, they're both the same? Yeah, of course. Okay. Okay, and it, it always did that or it just started doing it? it? Okay, cool. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> you can't answer it. Okay. Okay, I will note that down. Yes. <laughs> We're, we're about at 10 minutes anyway. Uh, you are an issue. Uh, so I presume it's enough time for everyone to have had a little bit of a play. Um, I, can't, I can't exactly remember the answer to the first question. I think it was, it was definitely soy, and then I think it was Brazilian beef, Paraguayan beef, and I can't remember the next one. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. And what's the next one? Brazil soy, Paraguay beef, Brazil beef, I think. And there's no, no, no fourth one. Okay. Well, that's the answer for that. Um, and then the other question, which buying in Brazil, it's actually the the. 
uh, the Sahadu, which is uh, responsible for a lot more deforestation and risk than the Amazon, uh, which was a surprise to me because I'd never heard of the Sahadu before a few years ago. It's a kind of um, savanna, a, a very biodiverse savanna eco ecosystem. And there's a lot more deforestation happening in, in the Sahadu than there is in the Amazon at the moment. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> exactly, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So the de the deforestation risk we do count back um, because it can be that you. It can be that there's a land spec speculation where somebody moves in, they deforest the forest, they leave it for a year, then they sell it to somebody, then somebody puts a cow on it, and then it kind of happens a few years later. So we, we, we count back in time and say, I think, it's, I think it's five years is our measure, if I remember rightly. So we look at deforestation in the past five, five years. Um, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you can, so I think, I think on, on that site, it's only showing our very latest data, but we, we, we do this analysis for every year, usually from 2010, so you can see the kind of trends over, over time. But yeah, of course, when the forest is gone, it's gone. <laughs> yeah, and there's not much you can do about it. Well, you can, you can, you can plant it again, of course. Whoa. Great, so I hope that's enough time for everyone. Um, so I was hoping... Uh, to have a small discussion or any feedback from you. So I'm interested firstly in whether the tools and the data are easy to understand or if you have any questions about it. I'm particularly interested if you think you could use trace data in one of your projects. Um, and then I have these three more kind of open-ended questions uh, from before. Um, and yeah, if anybody wants to say anything, uh, put your hand up, feel free to introduce yourself, otherwise we'll finish early. Yes. <laughs> Ah, there's a the microphone there. <laughs> ah, you said you have a, a SQL API. Do you, will you also have a REST API? Because that is uh, something that is coming. Yes, the, S, the SQL is, is it's SQL over, over REST. So it's a REST API where you can submit an SQL query. Ah, okay. yeah. it's, it's designed, for, it's designed for, for, web, for web apps. So we're actually using, we're using that API in this dashboard and, and in the site. Um, uh, as well, and it's yeah, it's intended for people to build web apps uh, on 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 top of it. When we're not actually managing the API, we're using this company called uh, Split um, Split Split Graph, um, and it's a kind of place where you, you upload the data. It's kind of like a Postgres over, over web. You can connect to it with a Postgres client, or you can you can use a web client and send the SQL query over REST. Good question. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Karsan Gabriel from Tanzania. And I'm interested to see that uh, the region I come from is mostly nomadic pastoralism as well as uh, movement-based agriculture. How right. can you trace that? First of all, uh, regarding that it's a very rural area and most of the substantial agriculture is the one that drives the economies and uh, there is a lack thereof of the literacy as well as the infrastructure for digital resources even though open data can actually you know uh, create a meaning for improval but how, how, how do you bridge that gap where I can be able to use trace data in a community such as that? Yeah so but with the first question about movement um, that's obviously usually more of an issue with with animals um, so taking cows, for example, uh, we do have some movement data on cows from, from Brazil, um, particularly if they move across borders to, to, to slaughter. But to a certain extent, it's, it's a bit hard to capture the, the, the movement of the in individual cows bef before they're kind of entered into, the, into, the, into the, the, the system. And it's kind of one of the reasons why our model is to a resolution of a municipality. Um, so, of course, there's some kind of inter-municipality inter movement, but mostly it's within the, the, the municipality. So it's kind of one reason why we can't go even to an even finer 
um, resolution than that. Crops is a bit easier because they don't, they don't move. Um, and I think in our model, we assume that crops are grown, that they're moved somewhere for storage, and then they're moved somewhere for processing, and they're moved again to the port. So we kind of, we kind of model about three movements of the, of the crops, and we hope that that's, that's good, good enough to mostly capture the, the, the model. Um, to your question about communities, that's a really great question, and I don't really know. <laughs> I would imagine that, yeah, I, I haven't really thought about how trace data could help the communities there, and I, um, I'd be interested to think about that, but I haven't really ever thought of that before. <laughs> maybe, open to explore, so, maybe mechanism on how we could do it. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. Yeah, maybe we can talk after, afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> Questions are always on the other side of the room. <laughs> um, <clears throat> sorry. Thanks for your interesting insights. Um, I uh, was uh, suggesting some uh, things about how to integrate your project to the open source or open data community. Um, do you know Open Food Facts? That's an uh, initiative in Europe, I think, that uh, they are collecting information about uh, food, processed food mainly. Okay. And um, it's um, um, crowd based, um, they're collecting cloud-based data, and maybe they have interest in integrating the deforestation risk of uh, food there, but I'm not quite, quite sure because you are dealing with, um, you're mainly tracking, um, for example, beef from, from Brazil, right, or soy from Brazil, mm -hmm. but they are mostly um, um, not directly delivered here to the supermarket, right? No, 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 sorry, that movie is a little bit confusing, but um, no, we're, we're, we're just tracking all goods that are just imported into Germany, and we yeah. don't really model what happens to them after, after that. But, but for one, one example is that in our report, we talk about leather that import beef, or leather as a byproduct of beef that's imported into Germany and then used to make leather car, car, car seats in Germany's car, man, uh, car manu, manufacturing. So it's all imports. Yeah. Uh, open food facts, but um, might be a good, good okay. place to, to uh, integrate. Is that open that food idea. facts. Open food facts. Okay, right. I haven't heard of that. I'll check it out. It's a quite nice initiative. Um, uh, most data is uh, from France, I think, and, and okay. the southern Europe. Uh, but they're cloud-based. Um, and um, uh, my little startup is dealing with the uh, question of transparency from a supermarket consumer. Oh, interesting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, um, I'm quite interested in uh, getting more data into um, and more qualified data uh, of deforestation risk. So um, I will really try your API out and uh, yeah. take a look if we can integrate there something. Yeah, I, I, I noticed you uh, nodding when I said the, <laughs> that it was difficult with the private data. Yeah, t it's totally. Difficult. Yeah. <laughs> because have, uh, there's no transparency in processed yeah. food, right? Yeah. You have um, some small ingredients printed on a packaging, but you don't know where the, the soy is coming from, where the beef is coming from. And mm -hmm. that's, from a consumer perspective, uh, the biggest problem, I think. OK. What's, what's, what's the name of the startup? Uh, Inoko. In a, in a Inoko. Yeah. Inoko. Okay. I'm uh, doing a talk in this afternoon. <laughs> oh, great. I'll come along. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, Chris Adams from the, the Green Web Foundation and ClimateAction.tech, an online community of techies doing this kind of stuff. Uh, I'm curious about what people would use if they did not have access to the trace data when they're trying to campaign for changes to, say, deforestation and things like that. Because the argument we've seen most, most, most of the time is that if there are groups who are trying to maybe win a political fight who don't have access to data that maybe another well-funded group can have, and I don't know enough about this field to know, like, yeah. if, there is a, if there is something like the uh, Global Canopy Project, what were they using before instead of having access to this data the, the visible here, for example? Basically, is how, there an expensive source of data that people have to pay for otherwise that you are kind of okay. making more widely available, essentially? Okay, okay, okay. No, as far as I know, no. Um, so as, as far as I'm aware, we're the only data source that's doing 
doing this kind of global level tracking of Im imports to, to deforestation risk. Um, I'm not aware of any other private com companies doing anything similar, but there might be, I'm not sure. And we don't, we don't currently have any different tiers of data. We only have one data and it's all there and it's all public. <laughs> uh, if that was the question. Yeah, the yeah. question, uh, the, the context I'm asking this question in is that when people are push, say, the IEA to publish more data to inform some of the kind of campaigning or academics or right. people who are not in a very, very small number of very, very rich organizations, they basically say, by making this data more, more widely available, you're, all, you're more able to have a wider set of people feeding into like, the policy making process mm -hmm, for this. Mm -hmm. So my question was basically, if there are proprietary forms of data that people would use, which mean that other groups or other policy making organizations have been excluded previously because there, it may be that there are groups who are trying to use this but don't know this exists mm -hmm. and haven't to, currently have to either have to pay for data or they are just don't have access to any data that they can base any kind of argument on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, we're really trying to get it out, get it out there. Um, the global global canopy also pub, pub publishes various other data sources on, for example, ratings. Uh, they have a um, Forest 500 risk um, index where you can go on companies and they they give ratings to different different uh, com companies. Um, but yeah, we're really trying to get our data out there and in use. Um, it's been picked up by the Guardian a few times for some uh, for some articles. Where, where did you say you're from? From uh, so the Green Web Foundation. The Green Web Foundation. Okay, yeah, yeah okay, yeah, 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 for sure. We're trying to get our data out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Great. Well, if there's no more questions, I would say uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, this is the links I promised. So. That was the name of the paper, I couldn't remember. Uh, disentangling the numbers behind agricultural, agriculture driven tropical deforestation in science. Uh, it's a really, really great paper um, to kind of break down and understand the drivers of tropical deforestation. Uh, this is a link to the, the report. Is there a typo there? Deforestation free imports? Not sure. Uh, this is a link to, to our blog post and a link to the report about Germany. There's a long URL or a short one. Uh, and then this is the link to the uh, French dashboard. It's kind of similar to the data explorer that you used, but it's in French. Uh, a long link and a, a short link. And we have Twitter and LinkedIn and all sorts as well. Thanks. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>